my name is Tessa. I'm actually here representing Anne Ferguson Smith, so that's maybe who you were expecting. So she's my supervisor and um, unfortunately wasn't able to come last minute. Um, but I'm a fourth year PhD student in the lab and I've been working on the project she was planning on presenting for the past three years. So hopefully I can give you um, basically what, what she would have explained. Um, right, so I want to start with something you've, um, you heard earlier this morning, um, which is that repeat elements make up almost half of the mammalian genome. Um, so it may not be quite as many as in plants, but that's still huge, right? I mean, that really shocked me the first time I heard this. Um, and 10%, at least in the mouse, are made up of a specific type of repeat element called an endogenous retrovirus, or ERV. And I want to give a bit more information on a specific type of ERV called an intracisternal A particle, or IAP, because you'll be seeing these a lot. Um, so can you see my mouse? Yep. Um, so they have two, two long, terminal uh, long terminal repeat sequences on either side, five prime and three prime, and then coding sequences in the middle that allow it to retrotranspose when it's a full length. So because of this, um, we see wide tra uh, widespread transcriptional silencing via both DNA methylation and repressive histone modifications um, to prevent potentially deleterious um, events caused by, caused by retrotransposition. So this is what happens for most, most IAPs, um, but some of them, and there's very few examples, but there are examples where this isn't the case, where they're not always fully silenced. And probably the most famous example is the agouti viable yellow locus. Um, so these mice um, are genetically identical, um, but the reason they look so different is because an IAP, so this repeat element I was just talking about earlier, um, an IAP inserted upstream of the agouti coat color locus in these mice. But unlike the vast majority of IAPs in the genome, this one isn't always 100% methylated. So when it's lowly methylated, there's um, cryptic, uh, cryptic promoter in the LTR of the IAP that drives transcription of that agouti coat color gene, um, causing the mouse to look fully yellow. Um, when, the, when the IAP is fully methylated, this doesn't happen, and you get what looks like a wild-type agouti mouse. And you see everything in between, right? So you can see that some of the mice are modeled, um, and that's inversely correlated with the methylation state of this IAP. So we call this type of locus a metastable epiallele. So the word metastable was actually used um, by people in the plant world um, before, before they did in mammals, but Emma Whitelaw um, coined the term metastable epilele together in the context of mammals in 2002. Um, and the, the word metastable, it's a bit of a mouthful. People say metastable epilele, what does that mean? Um, but the, the term metastable is really just to, to, to represent that stochastic epigenetic state, right? It's not, um, it's not stable, it can be lowly methylated, highly methylated, or anything in between. Um, and that's what, that's what the term metastable is trying to capture. And epiallele, because it's not a, you know, it's, this isn't genetically driven. There's not a genetic difference between these two alleles driving the phenotypic difference. Um, it's epigenetic in nature. So together we've got metastable epiallele. So we've got differences in, in methylation between individuals, but an important um, characteristic of metastable epialleles is that if you look at um, one, of the, one of the mice in particular and you look at different tissues within that mouse, you see consistent methylation levels. So you've got the um, five, five different mice here that show different levels, and you've got um, four or five different tissues, and as you can see, they're consistent within one mouse. So that suggests that the, this methylation state is established really early on in development before tissue differentiation, because this is even across tissues from different germ layers. So we've got um, inter-individual methylation variation and then constant inter-tissue methylation. So these are the two driving characteristics that at least our lab is using to define um, what a metastable epiallele is. So um, this is quite cool in and of itself, but um, one of the reasons it's so, such a heavily studied mouse model is because it shows epigenetic inheritance, and that's what, what we're here for. So um, if you take a yellow female, um, you'll see she's more likely to produce yellow offspring than a pseudo-Aguchi female. Um, but again, they're genetically identical, so extra information is being passed on where you see this um, 
transmission of phenotype upon the maternal lineage. This isn't what we see um, in the paternal, paternal transmission. So a yellow, yellow male is equally likely to produce um, this distribution of offspring than a pseudo agouti male. And something I'd just like to point out, because tons of epigenetic inheritance studies these days, like the one we just heard, track some kind of insult in one generation, and then that's what we follow across different individuals. So it's either um, an environmental insult, sometimes it's a genetic insult, and then you look at the wild type offspring of those individuals, but in this case, it's not. It's just innate inheritance. We're not tracking anything that happened in one generation. It's just a phenotype that we observe in these, and it's naturally occurring. Um, and that does, that, that does mean that some of our mechanistic discussions might be a bit different as well. That said, there has been, um, sh it has been shown that the methylation at this locus is environmentally susceptible. So if you um, expose um, females while they're pregnant to um, exposure such as BPA, so that's bisphenol A found in plastics, um, ethanol, folic acid, have all been shown to um, shift the distribution of coat colors in the offspring. Right, so that's sort of some of the intro. You've seen this graph before, but this, this is sort of why this inheritance of coat color is so shocking, right? Because in, uh, maybe it doesn't happen in other organisms, but in, at least in mammals, we see these two rounds of genome-wide epigenetic reprogramming during development. So you see in, um, in the production of sperm and oocytes, during, um, in the primordial germ cells, we see this rapid demethylation, and again, during early embryogenesis. So how to reconcile this with some of the effects we're seeing in phenotype um, can be a bit challenging. Uh, an important finding, um, however, and this is um, a now dates back to quite some time, is that IAPs, in particular, have been shown to be resistant to these waves of reprogramming. So here you can see different genomic, genomic regions and the IAPs, this is throughout um, gametogenesis, you can see the IAPs are particularly resistant to that demethylation. And I don't have the data here, but this was shown in pre-implantation as well with um, clonal bisulfite sequencing. So this gives a potential mechanism. Maybe IAPs might be driving some of these um, transgenerational <laughs> effects because they're resistant um, to these otherwise genome-wide waves of reprogramming. That is not the case, though, because when they, um, this is, again, clonal bisulfite sequencing data, so the, the black, black dots are methylated and um, empty circles are non-methylated. And this is upon maternal transmission at this agouti viable yellow locus. And you can see that there's a significant amount of methylation at the zygote stage, but then complete demethylation in blastocysts. So it means that whatever's happening during gametogenesis and whatever happens after the blastocyst, at least at some point in early development, this gets completely wiped clean, um, showing that the, the, meth the methylation state in the next generation is getting reconstructed and that DNA methylation is not the inherited mark. Um, so it, it might be a readout of something else that's happening, but it's not what's being um, transmitted directly. So this is the paradigm that we were interested in looking into a bit further. This is one locus, and I didn't give you the other example. There's another quite famous metastable epithelial called Axe-Infused, where you see a really similar um, relationship between the methylation state of an IAP and tail phenotype. So you get different degrees of tail kinkiness depending on how methylated an IAP near the Axon gene is. But I haven't shown that here. But again, these are isolated examples. And our lab was interested in determining how common variably methylated repeats are in the genome. Is this a genome-wide phenomenon? But since these isolated examples happen to be near genes that cause these beautiful visual phenotypes, that's how they were discovered. Um, and are there, are there actually many more? So this, the, this project and all, most of the data I'm about to show you was just published last week in print, so that was very exciting. And I should say that this was very much a collaborative project with another PhD student in the lab who's now since left, Anastasia Kozachenka, um, and has been, did a lot of the work I'll be showing you today is, is hers. So a quick um, spoiler alert, we did find some, and I'll, I'll, I'll explain how we did that. But then just to give you a primer on what the questions we wanted to ask following that were, 
what are their properties, um, so their sequence and genomic properties. Are they functionally relevant, the way some of these um, classic examples are? Are they reprogrammed from one generation to the next? Is there memory of parental epigenetic state? So do we see that similar pattern that I described for Gucci Viable Yellow? And are they environmentally sensitive? So we've answered some of these questions fully. Some of them are still in progress. Um, but I will um, describe how we got to this. So an important, for any of these, these kind of studies, these, this is on repeat elements, which means that there's tons of copies in the genome, and that will create a bit of a bioinformatic headache. Right? You don't, there's multi-mapping issues, and um, you don't know if they've been um, properly placed where they're supposed to in the genome. But actually, the sequencing technologies have gotten much better these days, um, so you can create much higher quality data sets. Um, but you still need to pick them wisely. So Anne and colleagues were involved in the Blueprint Epigenome Project, where they generated um, data sets that we were then able to use um, for this purpose. So they did this on two different mouse strains. So there's the C57 Black 6 strain and then the Castania strain. Um, and the, the st biological starting material were naive B and T cells, which are particularly convenient because you can get pure populations of cells instead of, you know, when you, often when you do this on a tissue, for example, you'll, you have many different cell types within a tissue, and you might be picking up on tissue type heterogeneity. So now we've got um, pure, pure cells, and they're non-proliferative. So mitotic headaches aren't, aren't a problem. So there, there were four biological replicates per cell type for B and T cells, and these were pooled from four to five individuals per replicate. And from that, from that starting material, expression profiles, methylation profiles, and chromatin profiles were generated. So that's RNA-seq, whole genome bisulfite sequencing, and ChIP-seq. So we'll focus on the expression and methylation profiles for this particular project. And the screen we developed was had to focus on something at first. Now we're like, expanding beyond this. But these classic examples had IAP insertions. So we figured, OK, we're going to start, um, start with IAPs and start with one mouse strain to begin with. So C57 Black 6 is one of the most common lab strains to use. So we, we, we focused on searching for variably methylated IAPs in the Black 6 genome. And at first, at least, um, focused on IAPs that may have the potential to influence adjacent gene expression, the way we see for Gucci Viable Yellow. So I won't go into too many of the nitty-gritty details of the screen, um, partially because this was a lot of what Anastasia did, um, but I'll walk you through the pipeline. So in, in Black 6, there are approximately 12,000 IAPs. So you start with all of these and then narrow them down um, for ones that were present in the Black 6 genome but absent in the Castanius genome. So that they narrowed that down significantly. And then from there, um, we only looked at the ones that were near differentially expressed genes between Black 6 and Castanius. So if one of the strains has the IAP and another strain doesn't, and it's also close to a differentially expressed gene, it might be that the IAP is driving that differential expression. So this is now a, a not too bad of a number to visually um, assess. So we looked at the whole genome bisulfite sequencing tracks for these IAPs, expecting that most of them were going to be fully methylated, the way most of them are. So this is, again, the, the IAP structure I showed you before. And if you were to zoom in, often these middle parts aren't able to be mapped because they're so similar across different parts of the genome, you can't actually get any meaningful information from them. But you can look at the bordering regions because they'll have overlapping unique regions. So it, that's quite important for now. And at least, you know, maybe, maybe the technology will advance one day where we can look at the full element. But right now and throughout this entire talk, we'll be talking about those bordering regions of the LTR. So this is what the vast majority of them looked like. So you can see each line represents a different biological replicate, and you see full methylation of the CPG sites. So out of those 552 I mentioned, 516 were fully methylated. Some of them showed this pattern, which at first we thought that might just be poorly mapped region and that might, we might just be picking up garbage, um, but we still called it ragged methylation. 
um, and thought this might be a reflection of differences in methylation between different individuals in the different biological replicates. So this was the initial biased part of the screen because we knew we'd only looked at IAPs that were present in the Black 6 genome but absent in the Castaneous one. And we expanded this to say, um, develop an algorithm to find other IAPs that show a similar pattern, but they might also be present in Castaneous. They didn't have to be Black 6 specific. Um, and that upped the number to um, more than 100 candidate IAPs that I'll now, from now on, call VM IAPs for variably methylated IAPs. And we're distinguishing it from metastable epileles because some of the studies we've done, we haven't done on those other classic metastable epileles who can't actually claim that is tr that's true for those as well. So that's great, but um, it's especially for these kind of studies, incredibly important to validate experimentally and look and see, is this actually um, variable methylation we're picking up? Or as I said before, is it just um, poorly mapped? So to do this, we used a technique called bisulfite parasequencing. Um, and we tested eight to 10 different individuals um, in tissues that were different from the B and T cells where these were originally identified. Um, and again, only looking at the bordering CPGs of, of the elements. So if we were to zoom in and get those um, few CPGs, this is what a non-variable IAP would look like. So the, you actually can't see it because they're so highly methylated, but there are about 10 individuals here, so 10 different lines all showing um, very high methylation. This is what a single individual would look like for one of our ver uh, VM IAPs, but if you look at other individuals, you would get a whole spread. Right, so this is really um, it went to show that that ra ragged pattern we were seeing on the whole genome by sulfide sequencing tracks was actually a representation of um, variable methylation between different individuals. So this is just one example. Here are a few other examples. And you'll notice that they don't all vary um, in the same way. So for some of them, the range is quite substantial. It'll be from 20 to 100 percent. For some others, it's um, limited between you know, 40 and 100 and a sort of higher range. Others are just um, stay in a low range, 20 to 60. And this is quite locus specific. So within the population, you'll always get, you'll never, for at this particular region, you'll never get a high, high methylation value. Um, so this is the, our first um, criteria was inter-individual methylation variation and that um, very much turned out to be the case. But I mentioned before that for it to be a metastable epileal, it had to show constant intertissue methylation. Otherwise, it might be some strange DMR or some, something like that. So this is um, color-coded for individuals. So these are two different VMIAPs. And as you can see, the individual that's highly methylated is highly methylated in all, all four tissues we tested. So brain, kidney, liver, spleen, whereas the lowly methylated individual is low in all of them. So the, what what they saw in Aguti Viable Yellow is very much the case for our VMIPs as well. So that was the beginning, and then we wanted to ask a, a bit more about what, how these variably methylated IAPs might be different from um, other IAPs and why, why are they showing this variability. So we looked at um, the distribution of IAP subtypes because, um, of course, it's not as simple as just calling them IAPs. There are actually tons of different types of IAPs that have been called um, these complicated names, and it's based on um, their sequence and how old or young they are. And this is the distribution of these IAP subtypes in um, the whole genome. And as you can see, VMIAPs are enriched for these compared to some of the other ones. And these happen to be the evolutionarily youngest IAP subtypes. So our VMIAPs are evolutionarily young. And another way to test this is to look at lots of mouse strains and ask whether they're present in all of them or whether they're polymorphic. So that's what you're seeing here, where since the screen was designed to find them in black six, of course, the blue is absent and white, uh, sorry, blue is present and white is absent. And so they're all, all the VMIPs are present in black six, but actually most of them um, are polymorphic across strains. So yet another piece of evidence that these are evolutionarily young. 
So this also suggests that there's a strong sequence component to maybe what's allowing there to be this variable methylation, even though the individuals themselves are genetically identical. So this illustrates that sequence isn't completely deterministic. Um, so these two VMIAPs have identical sequences. So they're, um, they must have come from a, the, the same parent IAP as retrotransposition occurred. Um, and again, individuals are color coded and you can see that the you know, blue individual, for example, is 20% methylated here and 80% methylated up here, showing that they're just the sequence alone isn't deterministic of what the methylation level at that IAP is going to be. Um, and importantly, um, all VMIPs within an individual don't have the same methylation level. So this is another way of showing that, where their methylation ranges were normalized, and here they're um, sorted from sort of lowest in the range to highest in the range, and individuals are um, aligned vertically. And you can see that the, just because you're lowly methylated at one VMIP doesn't mean you're lowly methylated at any of the others. So there's not, uh, oops, there's no global trans effect that's targeting and um, be acting on these in the exact same way. Um, so as I described for Gucci Viable Yellow, that IAP was driving transcription of a neighboring gene. So we were interested in asking whether this was the case for some of our VMIPs as well. But it turns out, and this we were able to look at because we had RNA-seq data sets, so we could see if there were transcripts that were overlapping um, our VMIPs. But interestingly, actually a minority of VMIPs are overlapping transcripts. So we did see situations um, where the IAP was driving transcription, but it wasn't um, a necessity that was then maybe perhaps maintaining the variable methylation. Um, there were instances where there was variable methylation with no evidence of overlapping transcripts. And I will show you an example where it did occur. So this is a gene where the UCSC genome browser would show um, sort of the start and end of the transcript here. This is where the VMIAP is in blue. And you can see that there's transcription initiating from within the VMIAP out. So we validated this um, with qPCR. So these little arrows are where we designed the primers. And as you can see with a very strong um, correlation between the methylation state of the VMIP and the expression of, of the gene, just like we saw for a Gucci viable yellow. So we sort of were left with this saying, well, what else might be, um, how else might be, these be functional if not by direct cis promoter regulation. And this brought us to sort of data mine through some ENCODE ChIP-seq data sets. And we found that VMIP flanking regions are enriched for CTCF. So CTCF is a transcription factor. It's um, methyl sensitive and recently it's just involved in it seems like everything, um, but I think it's probably um, most known for its role in facilitating long-range interactions and delimiting TAD boundaries. But as you can see, VMIPs are in blue here, and in red and purple are our, the control IAPs, and in a number of different tissues, so we have lung, kidney, and liver, and at different um, developmental time points, so embryonic, day zero, and eight weeks we see this enrichment of CTCF, which might be pointing, and then I'll show you a bit of evidence that, it, that it, this might be the case, there being an antagonistic relationship between DNA methylation and CTCF binding. So if CTCF is a methyl sensitive transcription factor that likes unmethylated DNA, and the methylation machinery is trying to silence these elements, there might be sort of a tug of war between CTCF wanting to bind unmethylated DNA and this being a repeat element that should, in theory, be silenced. And maybe an interplay between these two in early development might be driving this variability. So that's sort of the characterization part of it. And then moving to the, to the inheritance part, which is probably what you're most interested in. Um, the first thing we looked at was what happens to these regions in sperm, partially because it's the easiest, um, easiest biological material to look at. So this is what I was showing before. So you have at different regions, different ranges, and this is in the methylation levels in tail tissue, somatic tissue. 
And if then we look at the mature sperm from these same males and look at the methylation level um, there, you see 100% methylation and no variability at all. So these are behaving much like other IPs in the genome are. They're getting fully methylated during spermatogenesis um, and therefore being, being reprogrammed before moving on to the next generation. We're still ongoing as the oocytes and what's happening there. If anyone's going to ask, we don't have that, that data just yet. But we do have some information on the maternal lineage. So this is, um, these are four VMIPs that are um, highly methylated in this female. And if you were to look at her offspring, you see the full range being reestablished. So even if, even if the maternal um, somatic methylation level was high, she is still capable, even within a single litter, of producing the full range of methylation levels um, in the next generation. And the same thing happens if a lowly methylated mother um, is mated. You still see that same, same range. And as I mentioned before, each region has a different coefficient of variation, but that's replicated regardless of what the parental methylation state is. Um, so that's, I mean, that the, the mechanism behind how exactly this is happening is still very much unknown. So we see, we see inheritance of the, or no, I shouldn't say inheritance, we see reconstruction of the variable methylation, but that still doesn't mean that if you look at enough mice, a highly methylated female might still be more likely to produce highly methylated offspring. So they're capable of producing the whole range, but maybe the distribution, if you look at enough offspring, might be shifted um, towards what the parental methylation state was, because that's what we see for a Gucci viable yellow. So we um, looked at this by breeding lots of black six mice and using linear mixed effect models to figure out whether the maternal or paternal methylation level was contributing to offspring methylation level. And we used linear mixed effect models because it allowed us to look at all the offspring instead of just one offspring per litter, because of course litter mates aren't independent and so you have to account for that and these kind of models allow us to use um, all the mice we generate. So this is a summary of the data for one of our regions. So you have offspring methylation level on the y-axis and then maternal or paternal methylation level. And each dot here is a different mouse, so um, tons, tons of mice. And this is just the average across those CPGs I was showing. And as you can see for this region and based on the p-values, there is no contribution um, at this region at all. So that you get a remarkable, regardless of, the, of what the maternal or the paternal methylation state is, you see this reestablishment of uh, variability and no bias towards whatever the, the maternal or paternal state was. And this is what we saw for most of them. So we looked at quite a few of these, and in most cases we see no evidence of this epigenetic inheritance. We do have one example that did show a mild maternal effect. So if the, the mother's slightly um, is on the lower side of the range for this region, you do see um, a significant trend towards having slightly more lowly methylated offspring. But um, I'd like to point out the R squared value here that sort of is a readout of the effect size is just 17%. So it's just explaining 17% of this, and it's not, um, it's not huge. So the, it, it makes you question the biological significance, perhaps, of, of the effect. Um, but nevertheless, the reviewers um, pointed out that this was just a single region, so it would be good to maybe do a replicate cohort and um, confirm that this, is, this was the case. So that's what I did. And so we looked at, um, just took a much smaller, smaller cohort and took five highly methylated mothers and five lowly methylated mothers, looked at their first, their first litter, and then just did the statistics on the litter averages and in fact um, replicated and showed that, a, that there is some um, memory of the maternal methylation state. So overall, I, I guess our inheritance um, studies show that yes, it can happen, and we do see some that are behaving just the way Gucci Viable Yellow was. Well, one, <laughs> um, but overall, this is the exception rather than the rule. Um, and really, what's more remarkable about these regions is this complete reconstruction of variability from generation to generation. So, in summary, um, I've showed you that variable methylation in IAPs is really not a widespread phenomenon. So, we have generated this catalog of 
lots of regions that we can now um, probe in different contexts. But in the grand scheme of things, in the 12,000 IAPs that exist in the genome, this is less than 1% of them, right? So it's, so it's not really that widespread. A minority of them act as promoters um, in the way that Agouti Viable Yellow does. We see an enrichment of CTCF at VMIPs and are now very much interested in understanding how they're involved in this enrichment is involved in the establishment of the variability as well as in their function, potentially via long range interactions. I've shown you that reconstruction um, occurs at these regions across generations. So the variability is maintained and reconstructed um, from generation to generation. And that memory of parental methylation state um, does occur, but is the exception, not the rule. And finally, that VMIPs are susceptible to abnormal folate metabolism. Um, so the most important slide um, is to acknowledge uh, my supervisor, so Anne Ferguson-Smith, uh, who obviously was a driver of this project, and um, Anastasia Kazachenka, who did tons of the work that I've showed you today, as well as all the lab, current lab members, Amir and Noah, who are now looking into the CTCF aspect of things, um, Marcella and Nick, who actually generated those data sets I described for the Blueprint Epigenome Project, and our collaborators, David Adams um, and Erica Watson in Cambridge, as well as all of our funders. And you, <laughs> for listening. So Tessa, you said that uh, only a minority of uh, VM IAPs are next to, next to genes or adjacent to transcripts. Could it be the, uh, the result of actually uh, counter selection? So do we know if a very recently inserted IAP is extremely deleterious and will therefore be purged very rapidly and therefore the one you see are the ones that are viable, because that's the way they are, but the one that somehow the organism can tolerate? Yep, it's absolutely possible. Um, we, I think, now looking into different strains and seeing um, whether these IAPs are present or absent, and then looking at the genomic context and what their epigenetic state is across strains, we'll start answering these evolutionary questions of, is it, I mean, there, there is some um, papers out there suggesting that stochastic epigenetic states are actually advantageous um, in certain contexts, and this might, might be the case as well. So yes, entirely possible. But. And these uh, VM, I mean, these young VM IAPs, are they, I mean, uh, how young are they? I mean, some of them are already solo LTRs, and therefore they will have been subjected to. Right, some so kind actually, of the, yeah, I didn't mention this, but they are, there's an over representation of solo LTRs in yeah. VM IAPs. So yeah. while a lot of them are full length, the way I mentioned with the two LTRs on either side and genomic sequences, coding sequences in the middle. Lots of them are solo LTRs, but that doesn't necessarily mean they're that young because that can just happen within one generation, the LTR, LTR recombination. Um, but it means it's not, they're not so young that, you know, just so recent that they have to have the full sequence. So uh, maybe I, I missed it and you said it, but uh, you showed for the Aguti IIP that uh, the levels uh, of the methylations are correlated between different tissues. Is this also true for the other IIPs? And if so, I mean, uh, also with regard to the inheritance, you're looking at B cells and T cells. Did you look at the germ cells? Do you know that the levels are correlated with hap what happens in the germline? Um, yes, so they are, they are correlated across different tissues within, um, within a mouse, the way we see for a good viable yellow. Um, and the inheritance study is actually not done on B cells and T cells at all. So that's how we first identified them. Mm -hmm. But then all the inheritance was done with ear notching. So since we know that they're the same across tissues, that's really nice. You don't even have to, you don't have to schedule on the animal every time. It's, you could just take a small ear notch and then look at, look at that level. Okay. So. And, uh, what is known about what's shared between the one percent that are inherited? So that's sort of a, a big question. A lot of a lot of our studies are showing that they each behave in different ways and each be, um, respond. Actually, they all respond to folate, the abnormal folate metabolism, in different amounts. So some of them are are more responsive to them than others. Um, the the one thing that seems to be the overarching um, grouping them together is this enrichment for CTCF. So we really do see those see that enrichment for for most of them, um, but again, really early stages, so we're not sure how that might be involved. Um, most of your VMIAPs were um, 
belonging to recently active uh, subtypes. Uh, but would, um, given that yet you selected for IAP that were polymorphic between your strains, uh, this, this could be a, just a, a biasing for young IPs. And so following on your, on your remark on the solo LTRs, mm. wouldn't you think that older uh, IAP that are not polymorphic would, uh, between the strains, would, wouldn't they actually be more likely to be variably methylated? So the initial part of the screen was enriching for um, black six specific IAPs. So that first set was definitely, and, and of course you'd expect to see polymorphism there. But then that was just to first identify that pattern, that ragamethylation. And then we did a, an unbiased version where we said find all of the IAPs in the black six genome that show this variable methylation. And even then they're still enriched for polymorphism. Um, so at the beginning we did, but then that, those, th that data I showed you is then on the expanded set of all of them. So for how, how many um, generations the uh, VM IAP can be inherited? Um. Do you mean the v reconstruction of variability or the, so as far as we can tell, just indefinitely. I mean, there's no fixation at all. Um, and I've been in the lab for quite a few years now and I've been doing this you know, as an ongoing project and you, um, you really do see this, not only just within my lab, but since I've been um, collaborating with researchers from completely different parts of the of the world that have the same mouse strain but obviously have evolved within their own lab and they also show variability so it's quite robust so we haven't we haven't looked at subsequent generations for the memory though so that one where i showed there's a a partial memory of maternal methylation state for that one locus we haven't then seen if if you then select a lowly methylated mother from that set and looked at the next one can you slowly um push it push it to low or push it to high. We haven't, haven't done that yet. Yeah, if you understand properly, you could only identify in your first screen, you could only identify the ones that were mappable. Yes. So I guess there is like the whole iceberg, like all the ones that are completely similar may behave the same and you will never see them. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> absolutely. And I think that's why, I mean, the, the better our mapping technologies get, where we can get full genomes and our confidence. Yeah, that's why I say when you say one percent, I think it's another estimation you can... Yes, exactly. It might, 12,000, it might actually be even less or more than that. We might end up realizing... Among the, among the 12,000 uh, IAPs that are um, no sensed in the, in the mouse genome, how many are mappable? Oh, right, right, yeah. Yes, exactly. That, and as well, maybe we're underestimating the, that number to begin with. Um, I was wondering if you could sort of change the status of these particular IAPs through um, in vitro culture. So I don't know if you could make uh, regenerate mice from uh, ES cells and, and see if uh, they maintain their status or indeed they are s somehow sensitive to, you know, to, to a specific set of conditions. So have you tried any experiments in that direction? Um, yes, and we do have um, preliminary evidence showing that in ES cells they are more lowly methylated. Um, okay, but and, this and if you if you now use these ESLs to to generate chimeric mice or, or, or new gen yes, so that that's okay. way down the line. Um, but yes, we don't know if the low methylation is a reflection of having come from the blastocyst stage, um, sort of showing evidence of reprogramming, or because ESLs are weird and <laughs> do funky things. <laughs>